faces, some new ones, some familiar ones, but all of you are so welcome here tonight. Um, my name is Celise, and I work for the church. I'm part of the, the student ministry team, um, and it's really an honor and a privilege to be part of the team. Um, we would just love to extend a special welcome to everyone that is visiting us for the very first time. So if that is you, if you are visiting us for the first time, Please raise your hand. We would love to give you a gift. Raise it up high. Keep it raised. Keep your hands raised. There's some people over there. You're in the middle. Please keep your hands raised. The ushers can see you. Raise those hands up high, higher. There's some more people over there in the middle block. On that side, there's a lot of people by the door. We don't want to miss anyone, so keep those hands raised until you receive your gift. Is everyone sorted? There's some more people here in the middle as well. Okay. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone that we've missed? Is there anyone that hasn't received the packet yet that is here for the first time? There's still someone over there. Woo! Raise those hands. <laughs> okay. Any more? I think that's everyone. Glory. Okay. So in the package, you will see there's a chalky. And I always say you have permission to eat that chocolate in church. Um, so enjoy it. You don't even have to share it with your neighbor. But if you're a Christian, share it. Uh, <laughs> um, and then there's also info card in. So please fill in your details on the card. We would love to connect with you guys. Throw the card in the offering bag when it, once it comes around. Or you can give it in at the info desk there at the back. Um, and then we would also love to invite you guys to join our on our info groups. <laughs> so if you're not on the group, you're going to miss out. So join the group to stay in the loop. And then, I'm glad you caught that. Um, and then we also would love to create the opportunity for all of us to fellowship a bit, to connect with people we don't know. So I'm going to ask you guys, please stand up. It's going to be chaos, but it's holy chaos. Find someone you don't know, you haven't met before. Connect with them. Ask them how their weekend was.
All right, you guys can start finding your seats. You guys can start finish wrapping up those conversations. Find your seats, find a spot. If you haven't found a spot, there's a couple of spaces on the side blocks. So you guys can move in there if you need to. There's a couple of seats in the front row as well. So you guys can start wrapping up. If you guys want to, we've got a Let's Go coffee stand at the back after the service. If you want to continue connecting, or we have a coffee shop as well in town, which is called Cultivate. If you want to go there, you can meet up, get to know the people in church. It's always a cool opportunity for us just to get to know one another. Um, we love connecting. We love family. Um, that's what we're about. All right. Awesome. So just before I introduce myself, we just want to find out, is there anyone that we may have missed with the welcoming pack? So if you still haven't received a welcoming pack, you're new and you haven't received it, would you guys please be so kind to raise your hands? We just want to make sure we haven't missed anyone. So if there's no one, it's fine. But if you haven't received a welcoming pack yet and you're new, this is your first time here and you still want to receive a pack, then you can just kindly raise your hand. Going once, twice. Okay, no one. Awesome. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Clint and I'm currently an Amplified Youth Coach at High School Stellenbosch. Really enjoy it. Awesome. Woo. It's great. It. <laughs> Love my job. It's so cool to see what God is doing and what He's doing in the youth. Um, I'm here to give you guys a couple of announcements just so you guys know what's happening in church for the next while. So we've got two courses running or schools running. It's called the Conquer Series and the Redeemed Series. And I know you guys are excited for that. So 
The Conquer series and Redeem series. How it works is Redeem series is for the ladies. Conquer series is for the guys, right? So this is an awesome opportunity for us to learn about what is purity and what it looks like for God. What is sexuality? Because we're introduced to a lot of stuff and from the outside. So we think as a church, it's important for us to know how God views sexuality, how He views purity for us. Um, and these courses are designed for us to get to know that a bit more. So if you're a guy, Conquer Series, Goal Redeem Series, I did Conquer Series, I can guarantee you it'll change your life, it'll change your perspective, and it'll be allow you to see what God's initial heart for it is and how to live a life that's pure and it's so freeing. So the dates are there. It starts on the 2nd of March. It's this Thursday. So please make sure to sign up. Um, it's a great opportunity. Don't miss out. You really want to do it. And then we've also got our School of Worship, which is running um, soon. I just need to get the date. Um, from the 10th to the 11th of March. And guys, we've got a couple of people that are running this that are really great. And the best part about it is that if you, even if you can't play an instrument, even if you're not good on vocals as I am, or like at all, you just want to learn more about worship. You just want to know what it means to worship and why we do what we do and what's God's heart is for it. Like that is for everyone. It's not just for, so if you're a musician and you want to know more about worship, that's the place where you definitely have to be. But if you're someone that's just interested, in, interested about finding out what's the heart behind worship and why we do what we do and why we sing the way we do and what songs we sing, this is for you. Like this is really a great opportunity to actually learn and find out what worship is about. But I'm not going to say too much about it because we're going to show a quick video after this. But if you want to sign up for any of these things, please be sure to go on the info groups. All the links for the registrations are on this group. So it's very important. If you're not in the info group, you're not going to find those sign up links. So if you're not on an info group yet, you can find it at the info desk after the service maybe. Um, that's where you're going to be able to register for this. So we're just going to show a short clip on the School of Worship. Let's go. But everything that was gained to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of Him I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth, so that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ. My goal is to know Him and the power of His resurrection the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. abrupt ending. Will you stand? We're going to worship Jesus together. Amen. Excited to just be in the presence of God tonight. For those who are new, if you feel comfortable to find some space, for those in church, you know this already. Find some space. Let's just take a moment to quiet our hearts and our minds before Jesus. Amen. We really believe He wants to do something tonight. That He really wants to meet with His people. So let's take a moment. Thank you, Jesus. for your love thank you for your heart towards us Jesus that you would send your son to die on a cross for our sake that is the love you have towards us Jesus 
Father, that is the love you have towards us. And we love you, Jesus. We want to love you with in any small capacity of the same love that you love us with. Because you are worthy of it, Jesus. We pray for revelation, Jesus, of your heart towards us, of your love towards us tonight. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. There's a word that was shared with me just before we get into worship and this idea of a desperation and the story of the woman with the flow of blood wanting to press in to touch the hem of his garment. And he stops the crowd and he turns around and he says, who touched me? And I really feel like there's some of us here tonight and I want to agree with that word to have the boldness to press through the crowd to come to Jesus, to come to the Father. And he will stop, he will stop the crowd and he will look at you in your eyes, my dearly beloved. I've been waiting for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Awake our souls to sing Jesus to you tonight. Ignite our hearts, Jesus, to worship. In Jesus' name. Oh, wake my soul. 
his praise sing his praise
Cry, it's holy, it's the Lord. 
lift you in song this evening. Speak to Jesus. Speak to the Father. Push through the crowd. Lift up a song. Lift up a poem. Just speak to Jesus. got a word or picture from the Lord I feel it's like it's for myself but also for us here tonight and I saw a picture of somebody holding a like a briefcase for work and coming into this hall and just God inviting um, the person to leave the briefcase at the door and to take off the tie and leave it there and just come and I got reminded of the story of Mary and Martha where Mary sits at the feet of Jesus but Martha works and she, she's busy and distracted and Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Martha has chosen the good portion. And I just sense that God is inviting us today to leave our performance and striving and all the things we worry about. Should I lift my hand? Should I keep them down? Should I kneel? Should, am I dressed the right way? Should I... Have I done enough to be here? Just leave those things at the door. You don't need to perform. You just need to sit at the feet of Jesus and, and to lift his name up. And I just feel like God is inviting us to leave the distractions and to sit at his feet and worship him, spend time with him. He's a personal God. He knows you by name. He's calling us. Will we, will we sit at his feet? sharing is this phrase just kept coming up in my mind the son of god came to destroy the works of the enemy 
And part of the works of the enemy is dead religion. This idea that we have to work for God. This idea that we have to do things in a certain way to please Him. But in actual fact, it's He that does the work. We sit and we have relationship with Him. We sit and we commune with Him. And so as we sing this last song, I want to I invite us to sing in faith. Because the enemy hates it when we come and sit at the feet of Jesus and our faith is stirred. Because then the works of the enemy is destroyed. So as we sing this song, can we respond in faith? Can we just forget about the people standing around us? Forget about all our distractions and just say, Jesus, I'm here for you. Would you just open your hands just as if you're receiving a gift? Father, we pray right now. Thank you for your presence that is here. Thank you that you invite us not to do a bunch of stuff, not to perform, but to sit at your feet and worship you. We come in to a relationship with a God who has finished the work on the cross. It is done. The work has been done. Thank you that we can rest into your presence tonight. That it's you who destroys the works of the enemy. Father, I pray that you would come and remove religion. You would remove chains tonight. And you would allow us to worship you freely in spirit and in truth.
mountain you won't climb up coming at There's no wall you won't kick down Die you won't tear down coming at Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Now you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me yeah. There's no wall you won't kick down Now you won't tear down that tonight you want to come show us your love. Thank you that so far you've been pouring out your love into our hearts, God. Thank you that we can sing of what seems to be reckless love, but Father, we know that you're not reckless. You know exactly what you're doing. We just don't have other words to describe how great your love is for us. That you would 
leave the 99 and you would go after the one God. Thank you, Father, that your love is so much that while we were still your enemies, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And God, tonight we have the privilege, we have the honor, God, of sitting in your love, sitting in your presence, God, to say that you are the lover of our souls. Sing it again till we believe there's no shadow.
Can we give thanks to Jesus tonight? Can we give, a, give God a big shout? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, we love you. We love you. We love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can take your seats. As we're taking, as we're taking our seats, maybe just something to consider is the love of God is limitless. But if this is the first time that you've tasted of the love of God, tasted of His presence, this is just the start. There's more, and there's always more. You can press into more. Um, the ushers are going to be taking up the offering now. Um, so if you're visiting us for the first time, there's a whole bunch of hands that went up. We'd love to connect with you. There's a little card in that packet uh, that you can fill in your details. We just love to organize a coffee with you, get to know you. It's not to spam you at all or to uh, junk mail to you or anything like that. It's just to connect with you, um, to introduce ourselves. And let's give cheerfully and generously tonight um, to a God who is cheerful, joyful, and generous. If you're visiting us, you don't have to feel obliged to give. Then uh, while the, the ushers are taking up the offering, it might take a while tonight, I just have... Two announcements for us, um, three announcements actually. Um, the first one is Bible School. So Bible School is the place where we get grounded in the Word, we work through uh, topics, we work through theological concepts, where we, where we do Bible study and we, learn to, we, we don't learn the Word alone. We don't learn like you guys learn at university, but we're, we're getting taught about a person. And that person is God. And as we study the Bible, we get to know Him better. And so um, every Tuesday at 6 o'clock at Milleroff, um, which is on that side of town, we have our Bible school. There's still two open sessions, which means you don't have to pay. You don't have to sign up for two sessions. This Tuesday coming, and the next Tuesday you can go and check it out. See what it's about. See what it's like. And then after that, then you need to sign up and register if you want to, if you want to do so. Um, so please take note of that. And then the second thing is Encounter One on the, the 6th of March. Not this Monday, next Monday we have an Encounter One. So Encounter One is the foundations of the faith where we say, okay, who is God? How do we get saved? Why do we need salvation? Who is the Holy Spirit? What is baptism? And why do I need to get baptized? It's our life encounter. And if you want to go a bit deeper, if you know someone who has not done Encounter One, please invite them. Um, this is part of our like foundations of what we believe and who we are as a family. Um, yeah. And then the third thing is next week, there will be no evening service. Um, because we're having an all-in Sunday. <laughs> Praise God. So our all-in Sunday is we, the, one of the words that God has given us for this year is to be, be one as a family, to combine generations, young and old people. And so on Sunday morning next week at 9.30, we're going to be having an all-in Sunday uh, gathering where our whole church, every service that we have is going to be gathering in one place. And then after that, we're going to feast together. Right? So this is important for the students. We don't provide the food. You provide your food and you share it with others. <laughs> okay, but it's going to be an amazing opportunity to connect. We're going to be playing um, all sorts of sports on the field outside. There's going to be um, drums with fire, fires going if you want to bry a flacy. You can bring that, um, but bring some food, invite some friends. We're going to fellowship and feast together as a church family. Amen? I just want to see how the ushers, are you guys almost done? I think they're almost done. Okay. Shop. Then it's a, a massive privilege to, to introduce to you guys Simone. I keep on wanting to say Nordman, but Simone Pretorius. Um, she is like OG Shofar Stellenbosch. Like, I remember when I was a first or a second year, she and Luke Correa, one of our pastors, and George did like a, a first year skit on stage, and she was wearing a, a Hauswichter one-piece suit. Um, so her acting career started in church. 
But what's, but, but what's amazing for me um, is, is, is not just her career and just how she's followed God, but how she's grown in God. Um, the way that you measure um, someone's growth is by the fruit in their life. And so you just look at her life and you just see there's more and more and more fruit. And so it's a privilege for us to say, hey, she was here with us and we invite her and we, we want to open our hearts open our minds to hear what the Spirit of God has to say through her. Um, and there's genuine fruit. And so we trust her, and so we invite you to trust her. And so would you guys put your hands together for Simone Pretorius? So I am older than you. You are. I am, my bad. I'm a mother in the house. <laughs> uh, good evening, guys. Um, yo. Slacker. <laughs> it's so good to be with you all, to see an ocean full of faces. You are magnificently beautiful, every single one of you. And as I was standing and worshipping, I really just saw that as I stand in front of you, I see the face of Jesus in every single person of you. And so thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for seeking the Lord. Um, when I was here 10 years ago, was it in 2013, I think was the year that everything escalated, like everything happened, seven to Lord and everything. But the year started in church, <laughs> me and Luke doing a first year skit service thing, skit. And, um, and I just want to say that I started as a first year, yeah. Who, who's first years? We is the first year, the first years. Oh, come on, yay! I love that. Um, I was a first year, yeah, and to think that how many years later I would stand in front of you sharing testimonies upon testimonies upon testimonies of God's goodness, of what he saved me from, of what he has delivered me from. I'm sorry I'm crying. I'm an actress. I can't have the help I can't help you. But um, I, I think tonight it's important for some of you to see someone standing here knowing the utmost of brokenness, sitting in a chair in this church's service thinking, Jesus, everyone else, but I will never be able to do that. I will never be whole. And having to renounce and repent of the lie that I believe that I can never be whole because he did it. He did it. And if he did it in me, he can do it for you. So... Thank you for sharing that. I <laughs> forgot about that. Um, it's an honor to visit you guys. I, um, I really, every time I walk away, I feel refreshed. I feel refreshed to see what God is doing in this town. I am, I'm refreshed and I'm encouraged by the sincerity of your worship, the sincerity of your faith, how you allow the Lord to shake you, how you allow the Lord to stir amongst you, how you allow the Lord to take you into this, like to put you in, out of your comfort zones, and how you allow him to continuously add more and more and more. So uh, I want to commend you guys' leadership. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I got saved in 2006. I had to do the math this morning in the airplane because I'm not good with maths. It took me a few minutes. Um, now I forgot again. It's 17 years. I've been walking with the Lord for 17 years. I got saved in 2006. <laughs> Oh, that's crazy. Um, and then I came, I came, in 2006, I was in grade 10. And then in 2009, I was a first year student and I got baptized in this church. I got filled with the Holy Spirit in this church. I got freed from depression in this church. The Lord sent me out from this church. So you are in a good place. Okay, amen. So um, just a, a short, um, I just want to give you guys a bit of a lowdown. So I'll just share a bit of an introduction. I'm sure you've heard a lot now already, but I'll just share anyway. Um, <clears throat> uh, for everyone who, who's new here, who just saw the posters and saw a cute baby on the posters and thought that she was going to be here tonight and that's why you came. She's not here, but thank you for coming. Um, I have a short word for your generation, for Gen Z. Um, then I'm moving into Ezekiel 16. Um, and I'll be sharing a bit of my testimony, and then I believe there's an invitation, because with Jesus, there's always an invitation. And when you walked into this room, there was an invitation already. He made it very clear in the worship that there's a big invitation. So I'm excited to go there. So my name is Simone Pretorius. <laughs> I used to be Nordmann, an angry German soldier in World War II, which my forefathers probably were. 
And uh, when I got married, uh, my husband was like, you can, you can stay in Nordman if you want to. I mean, I've, I've been in the industry for a few years, etc. And I was like, your forefathers like started the town of Pretoria. I am submitting under that generational blessing. Amen. I am not Nordman. Weg. I'm leaving my father's house. I'm clinging to your surname. Um, I'm an actress, a screenwriter, and I'm venturing into the waters of directing. And uh, when I was four years old, my mom, we used to eat a lot of KFC <laughs> when I was young. And um, when I was four years old, I, I used to sing on top of KFC's counters for an extra piece of chicken or an extra, like, juice box. Um, and I think that's when my mom knew that I wasn't going to be an accountant one day. So... I think that was sort of very clear. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to shamelessly plug this, but I am hosting an acting workshop in Stellenbosch uh, the 31st of March until the 2nd of April. So if you are in the room, you are interested in acting, um, I know it's in your vacancy, and you guys are heilig about your vacancies, but um, it's the only time that I'm coming to Cape Town for it. So it's, it's a remarkable three days, and it's really exciting to see. It's not like spiritual, but it is spiritual. Okay, so if you are interested, you can just check the link in my, somewhere in my Instagram bio. Thank you, sorry, I wanted to say that. Um, <laughs> I have a daughter, <clears throat> she turns two years old in May. Beach, because I dressed her like a beach for her first birthday. Uh, but she looks like my husband, but she is like me. And that makes for a very interesting, interesting dynamic in the house. Um, so please pray for me. Um, she's the cutest, her name is Hoppe, and um, she speaks English to me. Um, we talk Afrikaans to her, and I don't know where she picks up English, but she calls herself Harpa, and uh, very British. She is the queen in the house, and uh, yesterday <laughs> she says to me, no, 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 it's one of her words, and stop, stop, but not stop, stop is what she says to me as well. And the other day I asked, um, and she said, yes. So I, I don't know what to do with that. I honestly, I just, I don't know what to do with that. Um, and then I'm married to Andres Pretorius. He is the love of my life. Um, I met him in 2007. He, wore, he had a mullet and he wore a PT bruki. And in my heart, I knew I was going to marry him because I'm from Centurion. And that's, <laughs> that's just... That's, you see it and you know, you know, you know, you know, no. He, um, <laughs> he's amazing. He makes every single person that he talks to feel seen and loved. Um, he is the biggest exhorter and supporter and celebrator that I've ever, ever come across. And he has an amazing sense of humor and he's so support. He's just, I so love, like he's, yeah, he's amazing. And what's interesting is we celebrated our fourth wedding anniversary this week. And it's so, um... It's incredible because everything, every, it feels like everything led up to this message because we celebrated our wedding anniversary this week. I walk in here and it looks like a wedding banquet. It's very nice. <laughs> Church doesn't always look like that if you're first year, you know, it's not always going to look like this. But it's amazing. I walked in here and at my wedding, there was like is exactly like this, like draped at the, um, at the unthal, I don't know, I can't think in English, at the ceremony. And, um, and also we sang Reckless Love um, during worship at my wedding. And the, th and the topic of tonight is Jesus as a bridegroom. So you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> you can't make this up. So I'm, I'm incredibly, this message really this past week has completely unraveled me. I, I want to tell you guys that I'm not sharing a message that hasn't touched my life and my heart deeply, deeply this week. Um, and so it's just such a, I'm just sharing the bedarfi for me <laughs> that God has given me. But I, I pray that you will be um, touched by it tonight as well. And then the most important aspect of my life is that my life belongs to Jesus. I really love him. He saved me from so much. I am... Um, my greatest calling in life is not being an actress. It's not telling stories. It's not even being a mom or a, a, a wife to Andres. It really is to love him, not to do things for him. That is secondary. But to know him and to love him back and to know his love for me is the biggest calling of my life, full stop. And so... The revelation of his love um, has taken a few years to really, truly settle into my heart. And, um, and I actually, you know, I look back on my life and so many things that, that the Lord has asked of me to do, etc. And I, 
And I look back and I think, wow, Lord, I actually, I think I actually did it from a place of performance and striving. And he has forgiven me for that as well. And it's not only that he just, he forgives us for the moments that we strive or we perform, and it's not from a place of purity, but he also uses it. That's how kind and how good he is. And so I'm, I sometimes think that my generation, I'm a, I'm, I'm a millennial, who was in, saw millennials in the eyes, any millennials in the house, I see you guys, I'm with you on that, we will win the fight for high rise jeans, we will win that fight, but um, I sometimes think my generation um, has a lot of unlearning to do with regards to performance and striving um, and really receiving a seat at the table. And I believe that, some, that God is doing something new in your generation. Um, he really, really is doing something new in, in Gen Z. And I want to tell you about it. So last year, myself and Andres, we, we went to America for a conference called The Send. Um, it was, yes, it's amazing. It's like a one day thing. It's more towards the American church, like getting missionaries out into the world, etc. We really felt the Lord say we must go and he provided in the most supernatural ways. And we went with Gabriel. He was here last week, a good friend of ours. And, um, and so we went and we're like, we don't really know what we're doing there, but yay, go America, <laughs> etc. And we're in the stadium and someone, someone is on stage from Circuit Riders and he shares a story of how him and a friend went to a high school park lot and they shared the gospel with one one boy and this guy gives his life to Jesus complete turnaround has like deliverance from anxiety and depression immediately experiences the love of God he runs inside the high school he comes back with a teacher the teacher's crying she's like thank you so much for coming I've been praying so long would you mind coming in and sharing the gospel with six more people in my classroom they really want to know and so they go in they share the gospel with six more pupils in her classroom they all get saved they get baptized on the same day get filled with the Holy Spirit and as yes amazing and as I share this, the entire stadium of 60,000 people erupt in applause and a praise. Why? Because, number one, it, it's getting a lot more difficult to share the gospel in any kind of school, not only in America, but also here. And secondly, like heaven roars and, 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 and hell trembles when any one single person from your generation gets saved. Like, I don't think you understand the impact that is on your generation when, when you get to know Jesus as Lord. And so I, I believe that there's an assignment like God marked you with a purpose. And I want to share more on that. So I really, I believe that because you are a generation that grew up in the digital age more than any other generation before you, I believe that there's a lot of options before you to satisfy your, your needs and your fulfillment, right? You can go anywhere to get your desires met on the internet, digital age information, etc. But when your satisfaction is met in the man Jesus, every other option is shut down, right? Because you will not accept a lesser lover, you will not accept that. And so that really excites heaven and, and hell trembles. You are not content, co not content, content, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you are not content with a fact check truth, right? So you know that any kind of truth that is filtered, that is sugar-coated, that is fact-checked is not authentic. So you test the truth and you are not content with a, a message about like seven steps to freedom or how to be more happy. You, you reject that completely. And you know that if the Bible does not offend you, you question its authenticity. And I love that about your generation. You have to continue doing that. All right, and the next thing is that you reject anything that is false. You reject anything that is fake. You love authenticity authenticity so much because lo and behold you grew up with Instagram you saw bloggers and Instagram influencers and you are just like I know how ironic that is that I'm saying that but anyway tonight <laughs> you hate religion that's where I'm getting at you hate anything that is curated or done out of obligation or something that is pushed in your throat and you you feel manipulated and something is try they're, they're trying to sell something at you you hate religion I love that about you and you know 
I, I, I feel like as soon as you meet Jesus, you see him face to face, you give your life to him, you will never have to rely on the religious spirit to perform in front of the Father ever again. And you might have run-ins with the religious spirit, but you will look it in its face and say, you might have wreaked havoc in my parents' generation. You might have wreaked havoc in church. You might have kept me from church, but tonight I'm saying to you that I have seen the living God and I follow him not out of obligation, but because of love, because of love for him. I love that about you you, right? And then for you, there is no gray. There is no in between. It's all or nothing. And when my generation, when we were 20 years old, when we got saved and we shared the gospel with other people, it was not met with resistance. It was okay to say that there is only one God. And a time is coming for your generation when that will not be acceptable anymore. Because we are moving into tougher times, Tough times make for tough people. But it's exciting because as darkness grows darker, the church will grow holier. The light will grow stronger. And that is what you will carry. I believe that because of your zeal, because of your zeal in the face of persecution, because of your passion for the man Jesus and the sincerity and the depth of your love for him, other generations will have to repent of our unbelief and we will follow suit in the way that you lead us to go. I truly believe that. I truly believe that. And so more than anything, I believe that God is displaying a radical love and a return to the topic of love for his church through your generation. A return to intimacy. I, during worship, just the fact that everything is just orchestrated for you to experience his love tonight. It was just such confirmation of what he really is doing. And I'm not sure whom of you are aware of the Asbury revival. Did you see about it? that happened in, in Kentucky, in, in, in the USA. So what happened was that a few Gen Z students stayed after a chapel service. They stayed and they, um, excuse me, they, they stayed together, they repented, they, they prayed, and then the worship team was like done with the service. They went off stage, they had lunch, and when they came back, the students were busy worshiping. And so they were like, oh, okay, we're getting on this bandwagon. They start worshiping. Eight, how many? 12, 14 days later, <laughs> the place erupted. People are traveling from all over the world to see what is happening at Asbury College because it didn't stop. It was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the sincerity of the love. And you know, in previous revivals, there have been signs and wonders and things have happened. People fall out in the Spirit and all kinds of craziness. With this one, it wasn't the same. It was the love of God that was so tangible and a fruit of that was humility and hospitality and a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, people praying for each other. It was so gentle and it was so sweet. And do you know what the message was that was preached at that chapel service? Actually, well, I'm not sure if you know, but I actually went and Googled or YouTubed it. I, I was like, what kind of a message did the Holy Spirit decide to ignite that had the students just like the hunger just was ignited. And the topic was the love of God. The most unassuming preacher. <laughs> He's just chatting, talking about the love. And like, you can't love if, if, if you don't know the love of God, etc. He finishes, he goes off stage, boom, revival. 55 million views on TikTok of this one event. It's on the Washington Post. The New York Post is commenting on it. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Like other worship services across the world is being sparked. And it's led by your generation. Not our generation. Your generation. So... When we saw what was happening, we sat and, and myself and Andres, and we were crying out to the Lord, like, make it happen in South Africa, Lord. We want to be part of it. Bring revival. And immediately we stopped and we felt the Lord say, if you seek revival, you get performance. But if you seek the man Jesus, you get revival. It comes down to that every single time. And so this is where my message comes in tonight. <laughs> So if the Holy Spirit decided to act on the message of love, then that's what we're pressing into because that's the, the theme of the next millennial, I feel. So Jesus is called the bridegroom. There's a lot of loves that the Bible tells us about. So God is love, right? And 
there's so many facets of his love. We know him as a father. We know him as a friend. We know him as a brother. We know him as savior. We know him as master. But the utmost form of love is marriage. And Jesus, did you know the first sign and wonder that Jesus did was as a bridegroom? It's the first public miracle he did was at the wedding feast as the bridegroom. The last sentence in the Bible says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. If there's anything that he wants you to know is that as a bridegroom, there's a lot of loves, but the bridegroom love of God, that's what's going to get us there. It's not a church, it's not a bride that looks up and is like, the Holy Spirit says, come, and we distract, and we're like, yes, but I'm just busy ministering, and I'm just busy doing all the things for God. It's like the bride locks eyes with the bridegroom and says, come, I am lovesick for you. I want you, my heart longs for you. I will not accept anything else. I just want you to come. I miss you. I want to be with you. That's where we're going towards. So if you don't remember anything else tonight, if you go home and you just remember this one sentence, may it be that we cannot love God if we have not received and experienced His love for us. So my message tonight comes from Ezekiel 16. It's them. This is what the sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem. Your ancestry and birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised." Not a lack of word. So God is speaking to Jerusalem, to Israel, and he's telling her how she came about, how he found her, right? And this story um, hit very close to home for me. Um, My story starts in 1989. Um, My mom was in the South African Air Force, and my father was in the Army. And uh, there was a policy for women in uniform, women in in the Air Force, that said if you fell pregnant outside of marriage, you would lose your job because it brought shame upon the entire Air Force. Um... My father didn't want to um, get married, and so there's this thing, and my mom decides, so she's been working in the Air Force for 10 years, she has this amazing career, she's worked for the head of the Air Force, so many people know her, she has a good reputation, she has so much to lose, and she decides to go for an abortion. So she goes to an abortion clinic, and the first doctor says to her, I'm so sorry, I know people in the Air Force and you had a blood test done and it's black on white somewhere. There's a document that says that you are pregnant and if you are not going to be pregnant anymore, they're going to trace it all back to me and I'm sorry I can't do it. Bit of a big imagination, but praise God. Anyway, so um, my mom decides, you know, she makes a plan and she reads in a magazine article in the Eisgenoot about an article that says that the South African government was putting pressure on the neighboring countries to change their abortion laws from pro-choice to pro-life. And my mom reads about this and she's like, oh, there are countries where it's still lawful or where you can still get it. That's unwetter. Illegal, dirty. <laughs> Illegal. And so my mom decides she goes to Botswana, she makes an appointment, she goes to Botswana. And when she gets to Botswana, the receptionist looks at her, looks at the page. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I can't, we can't do this. The doctor is not here. Um, he's overseas for, for research. Um, there must have been a big misunderstanding, but please come back next week. Um, I'm writing your name down. It will not happen again. We'll see you next week, Friday at 2. My mom goes back to South Africa. The next week, Friday, when she arrives at 2 p.m., the abortion clinic is closed down by the police that very morning because in that week, the laws of the country were changed from illegal to illegal. The next week, third time, fourth time, because my mom doesn't stop. (laughs) It's very tenacious. And so she goes to an underground clinic back in South Africa, speaky dodgy vibes. And when she gets there, the the doctor asks her how far pregnant she is. She says um, she's 12 something weeks. And he says to her, I'm so sorry, but there's a big um, health and life risk if we perform this now. Uh, We can't do this. Your, Your life would be at risk. And so that was the fourth time. And the fifth time she went, I'm kidding, there wasn't a fifth time. She stopped. She stopped. Finally. Finally, Tinky stopped. (laughs) Anyway, um, she puts me up for adoption, 
her family is uh, assigned to me. The papers are printed and she's at the social worker um, on the 11th of May, 1990. And the social worker sits across from her and she says, I know I'm not supposed to say this to you, but I really feel in my heart that you would make an amazing mom. Are you sure you want to go through with this? And my mom gets uncomfortable and she's like, oh, I'm sorry, I have to run. But I'm coming back in two weeks' time and then we'll quickly sign the papers because it was the day that she was supposed to sign the adoption papers. She runs out, she doesn't do it. And three days later, my mom goes into shock labor because the, the South African Air Force found out that she was pregnant. Her body goes into shock. She goes into labor. Two hours and I'm out. My mom's like, Get uitgekom, so se peil at the boer. I'm like, what did you expect? You want me to stay in there? I don't know what you're going to do with me. Obviously, I was going to just come out. Anyway, I'm excited to live. <laughs> And the gynecologist that's supposed to deliver me is not there. He's not on call because it's a month too early. They weren't prepared. So the other doctor stands in. He catches me. No one knows I'm an adoption baby. And they put me on my mother's chest. And you are not supposed to do that at all. And so my mom says, sorry, she's not mine. I'm putting her up for adoption. The doctor takes me. The nurse takes me. And they take me out of the room. Because if you're put up for adoption, you're supposed to be taken out of the room. Because it's the contact here. It's the eyes, Chico. <laughs> That's when the mom's heart, it's for bye, it's, it's done. Anyway, so um, I'm put in an incubator in the NICU, and uh, I don't have a name, I don't have parents, I don't, there's no baby clothes for me. I'm just wrapped in a pink blanket in an incubator. And so we're carrying on with Ezekiel. <laughs> Ezekiel 6, 16 verse 6 says, Then I passed by and I saw you kicking about in your blood. And as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. And this says to me something about, about God's character because the other nations, apart from Israel, when they wanted to get rid of their babies, they threw them out in a field where the beast could find them, right? It's the same as abortion. And so they throw it when no one passes by, but God passes by by. He passes by Israel. He notices them. And David says in the Psalms, my mother and my father may forsake me, but you will never forsake me. Isaiah 49 verse 15 to 16 says, will a mother forget the baby nursing at her breast? And I can tell you I did try to breastfeed anyway, but I, it's, it's, it's very hard to forget the child at your breast. It really is very hard. And God says, even if even if, it's impossible, but even if the mother forgets the child at her breast, I will never forget you. See, your name is inscribed on the palm of my hand. Inscribed means tattooed. It means written down. It's carved into the palm of my hand. You are mine. And then it says, your walls are forever before me. He talks to Jerusalem, but he's talking to you and he says, your face is forever before me. Your name on the palm of my hand. So God takes notice of you, right? He took notice of me in my mother's womb. Not because I prayed a certain prayer. Not because I asked him to come. Maybe tonight you are here. Maybe there has been certain things that has happened in your life and you don't understand why other people are not here but you are here maybe that you are alive maybe that you are sitting here with breath in your lungs Deuteronomy 7 verse 7, uh, 7, 7 to 8 says the author is speaking to Israel he says Israel the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people for you were the least of all the people but because the Lord loves you I used to think that the only reason why God saved my life was that I can stand in front of other people and tell them that he saved my life. But that is not that he saved me because he loves me. That was a core truth that I needed to get from year to year. And so just to finish the story of my birth, I was in an incubator and uh, my mother... After a day, um, they went to visit me, and she held me. I was crying, and when she held me, I stopped crying. And that was the moment that she knew that she would keep me. And um, because she kept me, uh, she had a disciplinary hearing in the Air Force, um, and there were repercussions to her decision. And eventually, because of her clean reputation, and I believe because of God's favor on her obedience, she became the first woman in the South African Air Force to keep her baby and her job, which was history through her obedience. Ezekiel continues in verse 7. I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew, matured, and became very beautiful, but you were naked and bare. 
And so after my parents, uh, my birth, my parents got married, but they got divorced a few years later. And I, like Israel, grew and matured, and the Lord looked after me. I stayed in my mom's house. I could know my father. There were many opportunities in front of me. The Lord looked after us, but I still felt naked and bare. You see, the, the wound of what happened in my mother's womb was still over my life. The sentence of death still lingered over me to the point where I wanted to commit suicide, where I felt so unworthy deep, deep in my spirit that nothing anyone said to me would ever make, it feel, make me feel better. And so I tried everything to feel worthy, to feel loved. I tried my best to be the best in everything. I tried to be the most important person in the room. I strived so hard. I was ahead girl in primary school, I was head girl in high school, I was on the SOC on campus, anything to just make me feel like when I enter the room and I'm the most important person, then I would feel worthy. It did not help. I went from one relationship to a next, to a next, to a next, just seeking for someone to love me, seeking for someone to choose me, to say, I choose you, full stop. No one could ever do that. And then by the age of 16, I went on a Winkelspreit camp. I actually just went because I liked a boy called Lawrence, and he didn't like me back, but that's his loss. <laughs> Andres is win. <laughs> Andres didn't choose me on this camp, and my heart was shattered because there's another reason why I'm unworthy. And so at one evening, we have a service, and there's a rope, Ooh, cool. rope uh, tied from the one corner of the room to the other corner of the room, and everyone in the room has little ropes. And the, the pastor says, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And apart from him, we cannot do anything. You can do nothing. Abide in his love. And he says, as soon as you are ready, because there's an invitation to give your life to Jesus, you are ready to, to tie your insignificant life to the significance that is Jesus. Tie your rope. And it feels like everyone around me was just like, la da I'm tying my rope. Look how easy it is. And they, ha-ha, giggle outside and have our chocolate. And I'm standing there with this rope in my hand, and I'm like burning with anger, but I'm burning for love. And it was, it's almost like when Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. I don't know if you know that passage, but angel wrestles with the angel of the Lord that was actually Jesus. Everywhere in the Old Testament where you see the angel of the Lord, that was Jesus. He wrestles with Jesus, and eventually morning breaks, and the angel says, I need to go. Like, I need to go. What are you going to do? And Jacob is like, no, you will not. You will not let me go until you bless me. I will not let you go until you bless me. And so he receives a limp, a hit on the rubber, is something here. <laughs> Both of us, they kind of done anyway. I'll check it out later. Anyway, so he receives a hit on the hip and he has a limp for the rest of his life, but he carries the blessing of God. And in that moment, I knew that it was business for me and the Lord. Because if I walked away from there, I knew I probably would not turn back. He would continue to chase after me. But in that moment, I felt like I would take my life if you do not give me a taste of life. And so I wait on him. I'm angry. I'm bitter. I found out about what my parents did. I'm like, why am I alive? Why did you keep me alive to, to make me depressed? Why should I deal with all of this? And you still, what, just allow me to take my life. And the love of God hits me out of nowhere. And I fall to my knees and I weep and I weep. And for the first time in my life, I feel like someone sees everything that's going inside of me. But they do not turn away. They say that I am worthy of love. And it's not just anyone. It's the king of the universe. With eyes like fire, he looks inside of my soul and he says, I choose you regardless of what I see. And so that night I give my life to Jesus. My life changes completely. For the first time I experience joy that is supernatural, that is not based off of circumstances. Sanctification. So we get saved, right? in a second when we give our lives to Jesus. But sanctification takes time. And so I'm not gonna say everything immediately changed. A lot did. I was washed of my, of my sin, I was forgiven. But it took time to really heal and, and start thinking differently about myself. Anyway, verse eight, we're going back to Ezekiel. Later, I passed by you 
again. Remember, God just said, but you were naked and bare. And then he says, but I passed by you again, which says another thing about the nature of God is that he passes by again, <laughs> again, and 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 he doesn't stop. He will pass by again, ready to clothe you with his righteousness. This is what happens after. He continues and he says, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my word and entered into a covenant with you. This is a promise that you make on your wedding day. Covenant declares the sovereign Lord and you became mine. And so when I, in that moment, said, okay, Lord, you can have my life, he covered me with his garments, clothing my nakedness. And not only that, it says, I swore an oath to you and entered a covenant with you and you became mine. And verse nine, I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you. How interesting is it that God first made covenant and then he washes. He doesn't expect you to wash yourself. Religion says, Wash yourself and then I will accept you. Not Jesus. Jesus says, I long, I come, I pass by again and again and again. And if you allow me, I make covenant with you. I give you my word. I make my promises to you and then I wash you. I wash the blood off of you. The blood that you were found in when you were born. The shame and the guilt that you carry. The abandonment that you carry. The rejection wounds that you carry. The shame and the guilt that you carry. The blood he washes off of you. And then it says, and anoints you with oil. Meaning that he gives us his Holy Spirit. He fills us with the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. What a gift is that. He doesn't hold that for himself. He's not like, I am God and you are people and you are weak. And so the very spirit of power, that, like the resurrection spirit, he's not going to keep that for himself. Like a form of pure love is generosity. He gives you the same spirit. And then the rest of the passage is about how God beautifies Israel, making her significant, blessing her, um, putting bracelets on her wrists, a chain on her neck, a, put a ring on your nose, earrings, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your fame spread throughout the nations. I learned that anyway, okay. But plot twist, plot twist. God tells us what he did with this woman, with Israel, how he beautified her. You would think that he did a lot for her, right? Plot twist. She turns back from him. We're not surprised. I mean, everywhere in the Bible, God makes covenant with us. And then like Israel is like, yes, I love you. Cool. Other idols. <laughs> the whole time. It's always like, yes, give me all the nations through the seed of my womb. And David is like, yes, the Messiah. And then they sin again. It's impossible for us in our flesh to honor covenant with God. This woman becomes disloyal. She walks away. She gets saved. She gets clothed. She gets provision. Not just like the basics. It's not like God is a shelter. He like gives her what she needs. He gives her more than she needs. He makes her beautiful. He makes her famous. And then she's like, I'm sorry, I'm distracted. And you know, it's not just, we think I sin, I got saved, but I sinned. Sin is not just the big stuff. In my marriage, I am able to cheat on my husband emotionally as well. It's a state of the heart. When he is not my first, first love in this sense, if he is not my priority, and work becomes my priority, money becomes my priority, status, fame, my children, whatever becomes a priority. I spend more time and energy and resources. I expect that from other things. I cheat on him. So we have all cheated on the Lord. And so if we look at the picture of this woman, if I look at the picture of the woman objectively, I don't know her. I just see this is someone that cheated on her husband. He was good to her. He literally gave her life. He took her in, washed her abandonment off of her. He was so, so good to her. And I see what she did to him. Like the extent of sin that is described after this verse is horrific. She sleeps with her own children. It's really bad. So when I look at that, I'm like, she must be punished. 
she has to like feel the consequences of her sin. Like that's like, how is she gonna change if she doesn't feel the weight of her sin? But God gives an astonishing response to this, like astonishing. In Ezekiel 16 verse 60, he responds to the disloyalty of his bride and he says, after all of this, nevertheless, in spite of your backsliding, in spite of how unfaithful you are, in spite of you parading around, acting like we are one because we are not, in spite of your spiritual showmanship, in spite of your religion, in spite of everything, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. And I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. The bridegroom is committed to us. He is committed to us. He does not change heart on account of, it, of our behavior. When we backslide, his response is not, I will forgive you, but I'm disappointed in you. His love is not insecure. He's not manipulative. He doesn't play on your emotions. He puts all of himself on the table. You walk away, he remains. He is steadfast in his love towards you. His response even to your backsliding is, my covenant. I remember my covenant. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, his response to betrayal was covenant. He got betrayed, and then he made covenant. When I get betrayed, I respond with offense. He responds with covenant. So can the band please come up? I think the most significant thing that stood out for me was that the only thing that the woman had to do was to allow God to wash her, to allow him to take her in, in the first part of the chapter. There's no wrestling. There's no, I am unworthy. I Maybe there was. He doesn't tell us about that. You can all stand with me, please. The only thing that the bridegroom asks of us. I always feel like I want to say to you, forget what you've heard of God, an angry God, a just God. He is just. But when it comes to you, he is passionately in pursuit of your heart. And he will not stop. He will pass by again and again and again. And again, and again. You only have to allow him. So maybe tonight there are some of you that relate to my story maybe more than you would want to. You know the feelings of abandonment and rejection. You know what it feels like to feel unloved. You know what it feels like to walk into a room just want one person to make eye contact with you to make you feel welcome, to make you feel like you belong. I was at a point in my life where every step I took was so heavy. Every step I took was, every breath I took in was heavy. It was tough to be alive. I resented my parents. I compared myself to every single person around me. I was jealous of other, of other girls that did better than me, that was more secure than me. It ate me up completely from the inside. I was so insecure that when, even when I came to campus, I didn't want to enter one of the psychology classes. I just, there was psychology. I didn't want to enter into the class because it was like an amphitheater kind of setup and you would enter the class and everyone would look at you. 
and I felt, I felt like such a fraud. I couldn't even walk into class. I had such, I had such body dysmorphia. I could only wear t-shirts because I didn't want to be seen. I hated every aspect of myself. But then he passed by and he said to me in my blood, live. And tonight there are some of you and you feel the weight of death around you. And it's not just that you do not know Jesus. Maybe you've heard of him. You gave your beleidness van geloof. You say to me, Ma Simona, I've been in church for like since I was a little girl, since I was a little boy, I did Sunday school. I know the Bible. Do you know Jesus? Because He is the one thing that makes everything different. He is the one thing, not obligation, but living relationship with Him. When He said to me, in my blood, live. Tonight God is saying to you, in your blood, live. If that is you, I cannot go from this place and not invite you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the most real thing that I've ever experienced in my life. His love has healed me, saved my life from the pit. I cannot not want that for you. If you know in your heart that you have never given your life to Jesus, you have never allowed Him to make covenant with you. You've been running away, or you've maybe just never heard of it. You never knew that God can actually be alive and speak to you and love on you and change you. If that is you, will you please raise your hand? I'm going to ask the bravest generation in history. That's what I'm going to ask of you. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If that is you. Bible says, thank you for your hand. Thank you for your hand. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. It's not just complacency, it's not just it's death. But he offers life to us and he promises that if you say yes tonight, you can spend eternity with him. If you feel stuck in religion, and you know that if, if something happens to you tonight, you don't know if you will see the face of God. Will you please raise your hand? Will you please come to the front? I honor you. I honor you. your name? Andrew. 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 The Savior put him here. That God is singling you out as I look you out a crowd from just a thousand there. Thousand there. Okay, one other. And I says, Andrew, for now, this is like you. Yes, I can hear you. It's amazing. Okay. someone that um, that can come pray with Andrew? Thank you. Okay. Bless him. Just give him an applause. A big, big applause. You know, that one person that repents, one person that comes to Jesus is like Heaven erupts in applause. Like the heavens roar for one sinner that comes to repentance. Like this was an example of Jesus leaving the 99 and going after the one. One person, one person. Like it may never get old for us. 
never, we can never become familiar with one person saying, I give my life to Jesus. I become part of a bigger family. I am not okay with my old life. I don't want my flesh. We cannot be the older brother in the house that presents the father for everything he does to make the younger son feel welcome. And so in that, in that same spirit, I feel like the other thing that the Lord highlighted to me was that we need, me included, need to repent of spiritual showmanship. Rampant in the church is us parading around, commenting on social media, posting things on our stories or commenting about what Satan is doing at the Grammys. But we are not going out to find the lost. We are commenting and we are just making, we're just like putting our opinions out there. But we are not seeking Jesus for a touch of love that will ignite us and put us on fire for Him. That when we walk into a room, other people get saved because of what we carry. I'm speaking to myself. So there's a religious spirit that we cannot any longer tolerate in our midst. The religious spirit that thinks that is better than other people, that looks down on others, intellectual, intellectualism, I know more about the Bible, I came further than whatever it is. Spiritual showmanship parades its sense of self around and relies on its own righteousness. It clothes itself but it is not clothed with the righteousness of God. It's me washing myself so that others can think highly of me, but I'm not thought of highly by God. And the opinion of man is what fuels me and not the opinion of God. Not obedience unto Jesus, but what other people will think of me. It's a self-awareness that I feel like the Lord wants us to, to repent of and shake off tonight. Because in the fire of His love, these things can't stand, it falls away. So if you want to repent of spiritual showmanship and return to the intimacy of your first love, to know the love of God, where your abandonment cha chains fall off, the chains of shame and guilt fall off, and nothing hinders His love in your life anymore, will you please raise your hand? Come on. Thank you for your hands. I, 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 I think the Lord wants to do something congregational. This means for everyone. It's just usher us deeper and ignite a hunger in us for Him. Do you know that we can't hunger for Him out of our flesh? We need the Holy Spirit to love Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us with hunger. Jesus says, no one can come to the Father. Ach, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So I feel like the Father wants to draw us tonight to Jesus. Will you just lift your hands? I'm just going to repent on behalf of all of us. And then we'll go into worship. I, uh, I quite recently, I went through a thing where I really struggled with shame. I didn't really, st I struggled with it, but I realized how much I have struggled with shame my entire life. It kept me from obeying God. It kept me from hungering for Him. It literally killed my hunger because I kept disqualifying myself. I kept, I kept seeing my weakness and my frailty and my sin and my backsliding and I felt like I would never have a relationship with God that was steadfast. And Jesus had to look into my face and, and wipe my face with oil and say, those who look to me are radiant, their faces will never be covered with shame. And so tonight Jesus is saying to you, if you look to me, I will make you radiant that your face will never be covered in shame. And so Lord, Jesus, we, 
we want to love you more, Lord. We understand that we have not even tasted the surface of your love, Lord. There is no depth to what we can experience in you. There is no end to your love, Lord, and yet sometimes we think we have tasted it all, we have seen it all, there cannot be more, and we become complacent and familiar with your love. And tonight, Jesus, we repent of that familiarity. We repent, Lord, of being content with the state of our hearts. We repent, Lord, of saying there cannot be more in you. And we cry out, will you fill us afresh with your love, Lord? Will you encounter us, Lord? Will you show us your face? Will you show us your beauty? When we behold you, Lord, the, sh the chains fall off by itself. Shame breaks off by itself, Lord. It's not a prayer to pray. It's because you love us. Will you show us your face, Lord? We repent of showing the world something, Lord. We, we wanted to show you. We wanted to show you our hearts. And Lord, we say tonight, if it's our hearts that you want, out of everything that is offered to you, you want our hearts. Lord, have our hearts tonight. Fill us with the oil of intimacy, Lord. Show us the bridegroom, Jesus. Show us what covenant means. We just love on us, Lord. We welcome you. We make room for you. We hunger for you. We want you, Lord. Will you do this tonight, Jesus? Amen. Just before we respond in worship, I just, I just feel like I need to be obedient. Um, The kingdom of God can be likened to this. There was a king who, who wanted to host a banquet and maybe looked something similar like what we're standing with tonight. And he invited, he sent invitations to certain people. And when the time came for the banquet to be held, he sent his servants out to go fetch the people who were invited and say, the time is ready, the banquet is ready. And when he got to the people, the people said, sorry, I, I, I've, I've got an excuse. My, my father passed away. And he went to the next person. He said, sorry, I, I bought some cows and I need to look after them. I can't come to the banquet. And the third person also had, to, had an excuse. And the servants come back to the king and they say that the, the people that you invited, they were busy and they didn't want to come. And so he says, go to the streets and find anybody that will come and invite them in. And so they go and they invite everybody that they can in the streets and they invite them in. And then the servants come to the king and they say, there's still more space. What do you want us to do? And the king says, go to the highways and to the hedges and invite anybody and everybody. Doesn't matter what their social status, whatever they, doesn't matter how they look or feel or anything like it, invite them. And they would come. I feel as Simone said this evening that there's an invitation and you feel like you've not been invited. There's certain things, there's shame or there's guilt that says, I can't come to the king. I can't come and eat with the king. And tonight God says, you know what? All are invited. Everyone is invited. And so there's an invitation to leave your religion, to leave your shame, to leave your guilt, to leave your past. Yeah. And if you would be so bold as to just, as we respond in worship, just come to the front and kneel and say, God, I want to respond. I want to come and eat with you. I leave my shame, my guilt. I leave it all there by my seat and I come out and I come and eat with you. And I, and, and I truly believe that God is going to encounter us. He's going to remove shame. He's going to remove guilt. He's going to show us His love tonight. And so as we respond in worship, as the band leads us in worship, if that's you, if you want to say yes to a full life with God, not half measures, God is inviting you to a full life with Him. Would you respond? Even now, would you start walking out from where you are? If you want to live a full life with God, you want to say, God, I want to give you everything. 
am no, no, holding nothing back anymore. Would you come? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, thank you that you see these hungry hearts.